I wanna rock and roll. I wanna give my soul. I'm wanting to believe. I'm not Until there is an arrest in this case, few people in this Waukegan neighborhood will sleep well tonight. Don't want to make it up. Don't want to let you down. I want to fly away. But I'm stuck on the ground. So help me to sign, help me to make up, make up my mind. Wouldn't that save you? Wouldn't that save you? Wouldn't that save you? Watch it all go by. I was in disbelief. Uh, at the time when they convicted me, the first time, uh, my demeanor was very aggressive towards any and everyone that approached me. So when I was sentenced to natural life and they took me back to segregation where I was housed in, I automatically got into a fight with an officer. I broke a door. So, I mean, to tell you how I felt, well, I guess my actions speak louder than words. I was very angry. I think the concept that somebody would falsely confess to a serious crime, it's, it's counterintuitive. Why would anyone confess to a crime they did not commit? It happened so often in Chicago. Defense attorneys call the city the false confession capital of the United States. Um, it happens, and I, I'd like to give you an example of one of my clients. Um, this is a client uh, who was convicted of a heinous crime in Lake County, and his name is Juan Rivera. And uh, he was convicted of the rape murder of uh, a 10-year-old uh, in Waukegan. And it was um, at the time that this crime occurred in the early 1990s, it was probably the most sensational case in Lake County. The community was looking for the detectives, the officers, to find the perpetrator that committed this crime. So when they place their eyes on an individual that's Hispanic with a low IQ, uh, no education, well, they pounded on it. He was somebody who was as vulnerable as you could be in the system. And he's already in custody, and they bring him up to Lake County, and they interrogate him for four days. And the last day that they interrogated him, it was 26 hours straight. Being in prison surrounded by individuals that are serial killers, rapists, mass murderers, I mean, arsonists, extortionists, I mean, not knowing what prison is like to go into an environment that is unnatural to you, it's very difficult. So, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it's, it's hell. I mean, there's no other way to explain how it is to be in prison, it's hell. Uh, I was stabbed twice because of this case. A uh, prison that I, does not allow any individual to serve time for raping or murdering any child, whether it be male or female. So yes, while I was in prison, I got beat up a few times. I got stabbed twice, went hungry a couple of times. So yes, I went through a lot while I was in prison. His name is Henry D, which he was the cellmate of my brother now. And this is an individual that's been incarcerated for, I believe, 46, 45, 46 years now. 
And he stated to me that I'm always going around claiming that I'm innocent, but that my actions are not going to allow me to go home. Of course, like I, as I stated, I was very angry and I was lashing out at individuals. So when he stated this to me, that kind of pulled me back and I started reassessing myself. Is this the lifestyle that I'm going to live or am I going to look for something better? So I started reading books, educating myself, uh, learning proper grammar, which I still don't have it, but I'm attempting to it. I study a lot of religion. I study the world's religion. I study the Hebrew language, the Arabic language. I just started educating myself. I don't know, I, I guess to say that how I lived in there was, I could only take care of myself because they were not. And what we were able to do is we were able to go back and look at that confession. There was not anything in that confession that was what we call original knowledge or original information. And it's something that the police did not already know. There was not one thing. And he still, he got lots of the facts wrong. And all of the details in this confession, and it was a very detailed confession, had come from these police reports from the very detectives who had taken this confession. And DNA, by the way, um, absolutely, positively excludes him as the perpetrator. And DNA was not available at the time of the original trial, and it wasn't until years later that we were able to do DNA testing and we were able to know for sure that um, he was not the person who raped and murdered this little girl. Even though I knew I was a lifer, I never lived as a lifer. As the scripture says, even though we are on this world, we are not of this world. And prison to me was just a place that my vessel was just dwelling. Uh, spiritually, I roam around that prison as I please. Not 100%, but kind of. I mean, I was able to go to other cell houses. I was able to go from my cell house to my brother's cell house and speak to him, see how he was doing. Uh, I mean, I just let go, you know, mentally. Watch it all go by. I did when I got out of prison, I watched the sunrise. I've always stated while I was in prison that I want to watch the sunrise as a free man. The following morning, because I got home pretty late, you know, and all the family, friends, attorneys were there. Early that morning, I wake up, a cup of coffee, open my blinds, and I looked out the window, and I watched the sunrise. And that was the first thing I did.